Welcome to the afternoon session, uh, hopefully after a really nice lunch. So you're really down, sleep, feeling sleepy. Uh, same with me, if I would have eaten as much as you have done. But I didn't, so I'm awake. Uh, welcome again to uh, a more entrepreneurship directed session as well as a business model canvas session as we already started a little bit to talk about business models and their potential change due to the influence of the web, the internet, uh, howsoever. What I would like to do is I would like to briefly introduce to you the important role of universities for creating entrepreneurial ecosystems. And after this, I would like to jump into our online format, e-learning format for entrepreneurship. It's one of the modules which is offered to uh, local as well as international students. And I use one of the videos to which we link out of this e-learning platform in order to introduce the business model Canva to you. And then again, I will hand over to Mario who will lead you through the uh, TV case, so to say, so RTL and uh, the potential influence of the web for traditional brick and mortar television companies. And then we will use the business model Canva again and we will work in teams in order to find out is there need for adaptation of this Canva, which was actually done, for example, uh, for sustainability-oriented entrepreneurship um, so far. So maybe we can contribute here to the state of research. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of background, uh, what the role of universities in entrepreneurship is, then come up with a quite simple model why this is the case, give you some examples, one of which will be Koblenz, and then well, I will advertise a little bit our upcoming master degree um, in entrepreneurship technology innovation management which will be based on a collaborative double degree program we are just setting up. If you look at the regional impact of universities which is quite interesting that we are a very very important player in this area and all of your universities in the respective areas of your countries um, it's quite obvious and it, there are a lot of empirical studies that universities play a major role for regional development in general. And I quote two studies here and which you already also find on the web. But even more, they are important for building up what is called entrepreneurial ecosystems. Ecosystems in the sense that you have infrastructures available like streets, of course, access to airports, etc., but also funders, startup uh, investors, business angels, and you have the human capital on the other side, so people who are knowledgeable about certain fields of research, uh, potential innovation fields, as well as entrepreneurial activities at the very end. And these are two MIT studies I quoted here, one older one, one recent one, which proves uh, this important role of universities. So uh, what is an entrepreneurial university? Actually, as I said, this is one of our buildings here in Koblenz. Uh, we are one of those. Um, an entrepreneurial university promotes really startup activities and initiatives coming from students as well as PhD students as well as professors. So the infrastructure I was able to build up over the last, let's say, six to eight years uh, is really directed towards supporting students. Uh, one side remark, one of the website students recently told me that he is now focusing purely on his startup and he quit all lectures, which is not good to tell uh, Stefan about this issue, but for me it's a qu quite success story and of course he can always uh, start again. Uh, it's also about creating an entrepreneurship culture, which is maybe more difficult in Germany than for example, in the US, where you know the mindset is a little bit different. Uh, you're coming from different countries, so you might reflect how entrepreneurial is the culture in your country, as well as at your universities. 
But in Germany, we have to tell the people that we now having this culture, and it's not yet lived by as we want it to have, but we do a lot of things like giving these kinds of presentations to make students, colleagues aware that we play a certain important role in this field of becoming an entrepreneurial university. Therefore, we provide a lot of resources and activities which are actually not yet funded purely by the university. In other words, most of it is funded by projects from the federal ministries. And um, this is uh, something, uh, if I talk to other university leaders, they have to be aware of, nothing works without funding. I mean, uh, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation if I look at myself and I'm active in this field, but we, you need resource. You need people like advising students how to start businesses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, developing online platforms for this purpose. So be aware of that. There is an investment, but as I told you, if students start companies, there is a certain impact also as a result. Here you see uh, our president to the right, second to the right, Mr. Heilingthal, when we won this excellence award in being an entrepreneurial university. We are the only one here in Rhineland Palatinate and one of only 22 in Germany out of 500 plus universities. And we are unique in the sense that our other partners in this network of entrepreneurial universities are, for example, the Technical University of Munich, super huge, super reputation, uh, super international. Um, RWTH Aachen, an engineering high class, first class uh, university. So why us, you could ask. And uh, one of our, our USP, actually you remember, was uh, asking Simon earlier this morning, what is your USP of your startup, of your so social entrepreneurship initiative? Our USP is that we have a strong focus on teacher education and our idea was to train teachers in issues of entrepreneurship, related to issues of entrepreneurship, so that they then can teach pupil at school. And then these pupil, once they get graduated and come to universities, really have this mindset of being entrepreneurial and maybe to start their business. It's not about turning teachers into entrepreneurs. I mean, I don't know if you know teachers, but these are not the people who normally start businesses. There are some exceptions. But it's about the mindset. And also, not every student wants to become an entrepreneur because it's risky, and you guys studying web science, you get perfectly paid jobs wherever you want to get a job in the world. Everybody is seeking for your talent and pays much more you will earn during the, normally dur than during the first years of your startup. So it doesn't matter. Our opinion is and our philosophy is that entrepreneurial thinking and acting is useful either for starting company but also and or uh, if you work as an employee because the settings at, un at companies are changing. Uh, this, uh, these competences are also relevant and becoming much more relevant in companies than maybe before. So what is a, once we talked about the entrepreneurial university, why is it important uh, due to the reports I showed you before? <clears throat> because they create startups and these startups of course are actors in an economy which already exists and there are studies saying that two-thirds of the turnover of a startup company is invested into the region. Yeah? So not only buying food, but you know, buying uh, services from other companies, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very relevant to have these startup, startups and to create them. But of course, there are also other contributions, you could say, of startups. I will not go through all of them. But uh, it, they contribute to a climate of innovation in the region. They contribute to social cultural development, uh, to the living quality, and most and for all to the regional identity of a region. A demand. Yeah, of course there's demand. There's a, oh, in, in general, there's demand for startups. But this is 
That's right. So this is not Berlin. Yeah. This is not Munich. This is not, Cologne. this is not Cologne. And this is not Hamburg. But we are very good also. Okay? And we are, you know, we are really trying to, to build this brand. I mean, I'm a little bit creating something of importance. I mean, the importance is there, but it's not yet lived by the region. So this is a traditional touristy place. It's about wine and good food. Uh, it's not about startups. If, if people in Germany think of Koblenz, they are not aware that we have this entrepreneurial university, for example. Same in Landau. You know, we have two campus. Okay. So who are uh, the institutions we are looking at? Uh, you know these uh, institutions most likely. It's Stanford University, it's MIT, it's Harvard University. So Silicon Valley, Kendall Square are the forerunners, so to say. Um, a lot of regions and uh, countries even try to copy these models. I mean, uh, what do you think about it? Can we copy Silicon Valley? Hmm? Can you give an example? That's right. Tel Aviv. I mean, by copy, I'm, I meant a one-to-one -one copy, but uh, my, my opinion is it's, it's hard to copy something in total. But the idea was translated. That's, that's correct. So uh, this is actually uh, also the awareness coming out of this MIT report that there are, of course, other regions who, who develop their own ecosystems, you could say. Um, if you send politicians to Silicon Valley, almost all of them come back and tell the others, now we ha need to have a Silicon Valley here, which is naive. Yeah? Because first of all, it develops over time. Secondly, it's the cult different culture and mindset of the people. Uh, it's a different market. It's such a huge market. Venture capital in the US is 10 times bigger than in Germany, for example. So everything is totally different. But the basic idea, having universities as hubs for startups and innovation coming out of research. This is also um, um, on the agenda of certain region, other regions. And um, I do not have the Tel Aviv. No, I have the Tel Aviv startup city and other cities, including actually Berlin, where you have a lot of universities, a technical university, but also other universities and a very, very intense entrepreneurial ecosystem. Have you been to Berlin, anybody? Yeah, so people who have been there uh, really like it and the, the many startup hubs and, and everything. Yeah, you find every. Yeah. I mean, you, you, ever, you always have to look at the French, you know, because they play a different game and also a competitive game. So Paris, I think they, I don't know how many hundred startup hubs they have in Paris. Uh, supported by the government. Um, but anyways, so in these regions like Switzerland and around Zurich, uh, Technical University, Barcelona, you find these ecosystems. And for us, that was also, uh, have been good examples to think about our own uh, Koblenz startup ecosystem. And uh, we labeled it Koblenz Innovation. It's about entrepreneurship, it's about the region, it's about the future. And this is now being an academic entrepreneur. 
I'm trying to build a brand for the region of Koblenz in order that not only the students and the colleagues uh, get aware of this possibility to start companies, but also other people maybe come and would like to join Koblenz region in order to start their businesses. And all of you are very welcome to do it, <laughs> of course. What are we doing? Um, some, may, some, some highlights, so to say. What makes us maybe a little bit different? Um, beside creating this entrepreneurship culture, which you see to the very left, Gründungskultur means entrepreneurial culture. We also started our own school of entrepreneurial design thinking. So what we did, we did a copy of the design thinking methodology of Stanford University. Has anybody heard about that? Hasse Plattner Institute of Design at Stanford University. Hasse Plattner is the a former co-founder of SAP, the, the big German software company, and he donated $30 million to Stanford University in order to start his design thinking school or lab, whatever, institute. And I got aware of this approach, and he actually has the same in Potsdam. I visited Potsdam, came back to talk to my president, said, well, we need this design thinking approach uh, for our university. And he was close to give me also 30 million euro, but at the end he didn't. It was 30,000 euro he provided. But it's 30, yeah? So pretty similar. Anyway, so we have our own building downtown, uh, our school of entrepreneurship. We, we are using a software uh, which we call the Innovation Laboratory, where you, it's a professional innovation management software where you can bring communities together to discuss to comment on new ideas you have. So it's a kind of open innovation approach, either within the university setting, but you can open it to companies, etc. And uh, for the most, and I will switch to uh, now to, the, to our online course. We developed an online course because as if, when you listen to Simon in the morning, he was saying, well, how come that uh, we still are using the same teaching approaches in school we did hundreds of years before. And uh, now we have these new technologies and they're not really prominent and visible in schools. And at, afterwards I told him it's the same at university. It's totally the same. I mean, I'm teaching an introduction into business administration, 400 students sitting in front of me after 20 minutes let's say 115, fall a little bit asleep, and after an hour, I know that those have maybe woken up, but the others fell asleep during these times. So very traditional, not thinking about new, new ways, and then we came up with this idea that we might use also an entrepreneurial approach to, um, to teach entrepreneurship. I don't know if it's so. Let's figure out. That works. Ich muss nur klicken, oder? Rechts oder links klick? Huh? Ah, here it goes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see it here. Good. Now I have to move. Kannst du zum, zum Login? Siehst du da irgendwas? Kommen wir da hin? Hier oben rechts zum Login. Wir machen mal user at uh, test.de und dann test. Und dann test. Okay, cool. So we are logged in. Okay, now, oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, welcome to entrepreneurship. Um, 
what you find once you enter, you find some introductory videos. You, you see here, this is actually our space downtown where we are featuring our design thinking courses. Uh, not virtual, but in, in real settings. And now I try to move to the content. And I'll tell you a little bit about the structure. <coughs> and then we go to the business model Canva. Um, so when we started this entrepreneurship course, first of all, we thought about what is entrepreneurship. And Mario gave some, some definitions on what entrepreneurship is. But what you can see is that, and you, will, you would see if you would participate, that the understanding of entrepreneurship somehow changed a little bit. Uh, there's, this is a strong movement coming from the US to Europe, and which is actually illustrated by the business model Canva. And if you want to put it in a nutshell, what the new movement is, it's more about acting than planning. So, of course, you need to plan, but uh, normally in Germany, if you go to a bank and you want to present your startup idea, they expect you to have a 30 pages business plan. Yeah, still. Whereas, if you go uh, try to attract investors or banks in the US, normally you have 10 slides and maybe three to five pages describing your idea. And then you get attraction or you don't get the attraction. But you don't engineer the whole thing through, which will maybe take you a year, maybe one and a half. And then somebody else took the idea and already implemented it. So it's about time. Not only timing, as we heard before, but it's about time. It's about testing. It's about prototyping. Uh, you are the guys who understand this better than, than me, because prototyping is a concept from, from the software development. Um, to, uh, field. It's about getting immediate feedback from your customers. If you Google the methodology of design thinking, it's all about when the, the, the certain phases, you run through certain phases, the very early phases, all about trying to understand what your customer wants to have or what problem your customer has. And this is not trivial. This is really difficult to understand customers. Because normally, and also when we consult students who come from the IT field, they, they, they love the beauty of technology. They tell us the algorithm is working so wonderful. And, and we try to find out what other features can we implement. But it's not about the features. I mean, then you have 1,000 features, and nobody wants these 1,000 features. So nobody will pay. So it's about understanding customers, etc. It's about these, this process of feedback between idea development, customer feedback, improvement, testing again, and so forth and so forth. And you somehow see it also. So there are what, what we label entrepreneurial methods. These methods are introduced. They have certain etiquettes like effectuation, like minimum viable product, etc. Business model Canva, when we come to business models, uh, this is all related more or less to a new, a more modern understanding of entrepreneurship. Maybe this is influenced by the web. Uh, because the web, and this is maybe something we keep in mind, is a nice testing environment. Uh, you can come up with a, with a prototype very, very easily and test it with, uh, with potential customers, your friends, whatsoever, and find out how they behave. A second... Um, Remark I would like to make concerning failure, because this is somehow connected to this modern understanding of uh, entrepreneurship and starting businesses. And actually, it's, it's very much tightened to culture. And um, I mean, I'm stereotyping now a little bit, but in the German culture, failure uh, and the German word is Scheitern, and if you look at the etymological background of this word, it means really destroying things, you know, cracking, it's, you cannot repair. Yeah? So the German word for failure is really a bad word, and this image of doing something really bad is the image of an entrepreneur who is gescheitert, yeah? who failed. 
And uh, so you see the, there is something like danger. Yeah, you are afraid of failing. And uh, if you and you come from different countries, like, like India, for example. I don't know how it is in India, but in Germany, this is more or less the truth. And if you talk to somebody and you, you need to tell him, well, I, st I started my business, but it didn't work. Oh, 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 what a complicated guy. Oh, he is not able to do anything uh, more in the business field. Uh, and then I stereotype again uh, to the US, if you fail there, if you fail once, people really love it because they expect that you learned something out of it and then you get the double, uh, double salary, double venture capital the next time you try yeah, because you, you went through a learning curve. Of course, you have to learn. I mean, it's, this is the basic understanding. And failure, also testing out, so don't be afraid of failure. Failure is something good, actually, in the methodology of design thinking. It's implemented as being something very helpful. The earlier you fail, you bet, the better, of course. And now, coming back to my point, writing a business plan of 30 pages for a year, presenting to a bank, and they tell you, well, don't you think that you need to adapt a little bit? You, as the one who has written 30 pages, you don't like to change anything in this plan after one year. Okay, so you say, this is the wrong bank. They didn't understand me. You go to the next one, and the same will happen again and again. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let me show you, or come back to the structure of this lecture. Actually, this is open. This will uh, reopen again, the openership course, very soon. So you are all invited to participate. Uh, everybody can participate. It's uh, free of charge. And... Uh, we are very happy to see your applications. Um, let me come to the business models. The one point, uh, the one um, dimension of this online lecture is really coming up with an assignment. So you are supposed to, for example, do some interviews with entrepreneurs. You're supposed to look at certain startups and find out what are their specifics, their unique selling propositions. And over the course, over these 10 weeks, you're supposed to come up with your own startup idea. And you're supposed to do an elevator pitching. So you need somebody who handicaps you and uh, present your idea in one minute. And you're also supposed to do a presentation for about 10 minutes with PowerPoint slides. You upload everything and then we, we grade it. So this is really the work done by yourself. On the other side, there are these video-based lectures. So uh, what I did, I created the content, the structure of the content, the syllabus, so to say. But then we are using YouTube videos, and we link to YouTube in order to actually, actually let the people talk to the students who invented concepts, like the, the concept of effectuation was invented by Sarah Sharaswathi. Of course, I can teach it, but it's much nicer if you listen to her, who invented the concept. So this is the basic idea. And we have some questions, uh, more or less as takeaways for the students. These are always questions like, what do you think was the main, the main idea of this video, or uh, write down the the things which you really liked of this video, so it's for you. We don't grade your answer, which is actually not possible to try it. Uh, and then at the end, you can push a button and you have a PDF document with all your answers, like this is your takeaway out of this course of these uh, online videos. And this is an example now, uh, how it works. Hopefully it works. Uh, this is new media competences I need to have. <laughs> My kids would see me, they would laugh. Now, uh, do we have the, the voice? Should be on. OK. so. Uh, the video, uh, the business model Canva was in, uh, invented by Osterwalder and he, he created this uh, strategizer institute and this is the video from these people. And 
Now let me see if I can. This is the business model canvas. It's just what Beth and Carl will need to craft a powerful business model, and it can do the same for you. Let's dive in and see how it works. There are nine essential building blocks that make up any business model. When you get all nine blocks working together, you'll have answered the fundamental questions any business model must solve. We'll start here with customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the types of relationships you're establishing with your customers and how you're acquiring and retaining them. Pricing mechanisms through which your business model captures value are documented under revenue streams. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model, so you can describe the infrastructure you need to create, deliver and capture value. The key activities show which things you need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. Any business model can be mapped this way. Nine building blocks working to reinforce and strengthen each other. But before you make a model for yourself, it helps to see what a breakthrough business model looks like in action, like this one. Low-cost airlines revolutionized air travel thanks to their disruptive business model. Let's first look at their value proposition. A low-cost airline offers ultra-cheap flights to their main customer segment, budget travelers, by adopting a no-frills policy. And this leads to additional revenue streams, because customers pay for their ticket and additional fees on items like food and drink, priority boarding and luggage. The airlines save even more money through their choice of channels, selling only through call centers and the internet, making for efficient, if not always convenient, customer relationships that are automated and often impersonal. Okay, that covers the right side of the canvas, the part everyone can see. The left side of the canvas is what's going on backstage. Like their choice of key resources, they reduce maintenance and training costs by using a single aircraft model for the whole fleet. And they only fly to cheap airports where it's cost efficient to land or where they even get paid to touch down. Planes that do land have quick turnarounds, so they get back in the air earning money as quickly as possible. And they form key partnerships with others in the travel industry, like car rental, hotel and insurance companies. Finally, under cost structures, all maintenance, training, airport and call centre costs are trimmed to their lowest levels. All of these pieces working together make their fares almost impossible for traditional airlines to compete with. There's nothing superior about these airlines except their business models. They're reaching an entirely new segment of travelers out of reach for traditional airlines. Hmm. Cutting out costs is pretty exciting, right? But wait, hmm. just because it's successful for discount airlines doesn't mean it will work for your idea. Luckily, the business model canvas allows you to iterate many models and test them quickly. Let's get started with your own business idea. Okay. Translation in German <laughs> doesn't make sense here, but for our students, sometimes it makes sense. So this is the business model Canva. As I said, it's um, maybe a reflection on this easy to start um, <coughs> testing, uh, trying to be uh, iterative, improving step by step, uh, prototyping a model and you have everything on one page and actually we have, we have these pages with us and uh, now I think it would be, uh, it's, uh, since I, we know that you really hard uh, thought about the RTL case and uh, the television brick and mortars over lunch I suppose, we suppose, <laughs> that we try to go again through this um, challenge. Mario will lead you through uh, this challenge and then you would like to come back to um, a more teamwork based approach trying to figure out first of all does the business model Canva as it was developed fit with startups on the web with web entrepreneurship and um, if not where are the differences 
And maybe using this pause, uh, if you think of customer segments, and maybe actually the web brings in a meta perspective to all entrepreneurial activities. I was wondering when I was listening, for example, this morning to, to Simon when he talked about uh, learning and analytics and adaptive learning. This is, I think, this is a secret which was not possible before. Uh, because you can monitor digital behavior of people only in digital environments using the respective algorithms to do so. This is really a huge difference. So maybe customer behavior is something totally different in this world compared to the other world because it was just not possible. I mean, it, of course, you can calculate traveling to the moon by hand, but it takes you a couple of hundred years, yeah? So now we have computer power, maybe a similar example. Also, the question of failure. Maybe failure uh, has a totally new dimension, therefore I, I mentioned this uh, important concept, so to say, for an entrepreneur, uh, because maybe this is the 100% testing field for everything in the future. And the notion of failure, um, um, is maybe not uh, worth to be mentioned in classes because if you fail, nobody recognizes that you fail on the one hand. On the other hand, it's maybe becoming normal that you test out business ideas by using the web. Anyway, so this is my, my, my first access to the question web entrepreneurship and business model or web-based business models, Canva. Do we need to adapt or not? Maybe it's a meta perspective, but maybe you come up with other ideas.